black girls grow up in a culture where they're not uh, within the space of race privilege or gender privilege in America. So they find themselves outside of those spaces of acceptance, beauty, accepted brilliance. And so oftentimes they have to define their own spaces. And for some of them, if they grow up in nurturing environments, that's doable. But for others, it becomes more difficult. Originally, my childhood started out in Brooklyn with both my parents. At um, about two or three years old, my mom became very ill with some medical complications. And by the time I was four years old, she ended up passing away. I was raised with my three other siblings, my two older brothers and my sister. We all had to relocate to Long Island um, with other family while my mom was going through medical treatment until she passed. A couple of months after my fourth birthday, we moved in with another cousin in Long Island and we stayed there with her temporarily until my parents, my family decided where we were going to be split up. And then shortly thereafter, I ended up leaving New York and moved to Maryland with um, some cousins of mine who I had never met before and they eventually adopted me while my two older brothers and my sister stayed back in New York. I remember just getting in a car, probably for the first time that I can remember being in a car at four and moving to some strange place and not knowing who these people were, not knowing why I was leaving New York. I don't even remember anyone explaining to me why I left New York and I was the only person to leave and my siblings didn't come with me. I would say it was a hard transition later as I got to be uh, a middle school kid and you know, kids start teasing you because you talk differently and um, they want to know why you don't sound like them and where you're real parents are when you start referring to people as your godparents and not your mom and your dad, kids start to ask a lot of questions. So I started to feel very different from the other kids around me. I started to feel like I didn't belong. I think I became resentful that I was the only person that was chosen to leave New York and to move in with these people um, without my family. I missed New York a great deal. So for me initially, it was very hard to um, leave what was familiar and not have certain questions answered about my mother's death and then eventually at nine, my father passed away. And I, I went to that funeral and that's where I reconnected with a lot of my siblings. I definitely um, love my godparents. I appreciated them. You know, when you're a kid, you don't really appreciate a lot of things that your, your folks do for you. And I had the usual, you know, ups and downs, being a teenager, living with my godmother and my godfather. I fortunately was able to, um, by the time I hit 11, split my time between New York and Maryland. So I would, go to school in Maryland during the school year and then from 11 to 17 years old I actually came back home to New York and I would work and I would spend time with my, my aunt and see some of my siblings and that kind of thing until it was over. My name is Kimberly Truman Graves. I was born and raised in Southwest Philadelphia. Uh, my childhood was filled with adventure. <laughs> I have three older brothers and we grew up in a time when there was a lot of gang activity and a lot of police brutality and it was the beginning of using drugs heavier than marijuana for younger people. It affected my family in a big way. Um, all of my brothers experimented with drugs, two of them pretty long term, eventually moving on to crack. All of my uncles, except for one, I have four uncles three living, one deceased, OD from drugs. It was not just my brothers and my uncles, it was first cousins, my mother's first cousin, because my grandmother was one of 13, and so we were thick 
there's a lot of us. And at any given period, more than half of any generation was on drugs. Everybody started with marijuana and they advanced. We moved around a lot from different, we had a lot of different apartments and um, we really didn't realize how poor we was. My father was a working man, my mother stayed at home. And when I was about 15 years old, we moved into the Jackson Projects and my mother was a little saddened by it and I realized now she didn't want us in that environment. And sometimes you move into projects, it's like you almost get trapped and the environment plays a big role on the children. Growing up in Brooklyn during the uh, 80s and 90s was uh, very interesting. I grew up in a single parent home with my uh, mother, my older sister Pam, my grandmother, and throughout the years we had various extended family members there, aunts, uncles, cousins. Um, and one of the things that I remember most about growing up in Brooklyn was that the crime was so bad and drugs were so rampant that on the way home from school I used to look at the number of crack vials that were on the street. There were so many that you could count, you know, you couldn't count all the, of the crack vials that you saw on the street. And as a result, my mom uh, never really let me go outside to play. Um, and most kids learned how to ride bikes and they jumped rope outside, but because my mother was so concerned about the violence, the drugs, and just all of the bad things that could happen to a young girl at that time, I was only really allowed to go to school and come home and we participated in a lot of activities but mostly outside of the neighborhood. My name is L. Joy Williams. Um, I was born in Manhattan, Kansas, um, but grew up in Rosedale, Queens, New York. My father was in the military at the time and was stationed in Kansas. My parents split up when I was about three. Um, and at that time we were in Kansas or um, in between Kansas and New York. And my parents thought it was better for stability. Um, mainly my mother thought better for stability for me to live with my grandmother. I think from my conversations with my mom, it was supposed to be a temporary fix. And I ended up staying with my grandmother till I was about 12. It had an extreme effect um, on, on my relationship with my parents, on my relationship with my grandmother, and I think ultimately relationships that I had in the future and being able to trust people, being able to have um, confidence that people would stay with me. Not growing up with my parents, you know, in the same household affected my relationship with my mother because my mother then remarried, moved away, and had other kids. And so there were often times where I would go months, maybe longest a year without hearing from my mom. And from a child's perspective, she's married, she has other kids. What's the reason, why, why can't I live with my mom? Why am I shipped off to live with my grandmother? Um, and sort of what's wrong with me or what's, you know, does she not want me in her life or, you know, sort of things like that. So my grandmother tells a story oftentimes and I remember sometimes, you know, crying, why won't my mother call me, you know, and she lived um, overseas. She lived in Germany for, for a good portion of that time. And so calling over there back then and, you know, things like that was, um, uh, difficult so it had an extreme effect and I you know not living with my mom I sort of idolized and sort of dreamt up what living with her would be like um, and so I, I think sometimes I may have you know not really seen as a child what I had in living with my grandmother now my relationship with my grandmother I mean you know she walks on water to me <laughs> so um, because of how you know how she raised me the um, information she imparted into me as I grew up with her and then also you know her really taking you know, the time to make sure I was loved and make sure um, that I had attention because I wasn't with my parents. When I was about 11, almost 11 years old, my parents separated. Um, my father was going through a particularly rough time in his career and my parents had always had a rocky marriage. So at age by probably about 11 and a half, we were in separate households. 
By the time I was 13, they were permanently apart. When my parents divorced, my father stayed in Toronto for, I guess, about 10 more years. And he started another family uh, with another woman. Uh, so I have two younger half-siblings. Um, but my mother, you know, was pretty much devastated by the divorce and kind of saw her, her life's vision vanish almost overnight. Uh, and so I grew up uh, in a single parent household. Both my parents were school teachers, but only my dad had gone to college. My mom had worked to help put my dad through college, but she didn't get to go herself. Um, she had a couple of major strokes while I was in high school, uh, and we just had next to no money. <laughs> we were living in a white suburb, and I went to excellent public schools, and I'm grateful for that. I had an excellent public education, uh, but it was really difficult to not only be one of the only students of color, in the school, but to be one of the only students who was working class. You know, I didn't get a car when I turned 16, and I didn't get sent to Europe for the tour, and uh, I didn't have someone giving me money, pocket change. You know, I started working when I was 11, <laughs> and, uh, and have been working <laughs> to this day. And I like to say that my parents, um, you know, their parenting philosophy was laissez-faire. The less they did, the better we fared. We just kind of learned early on that we had to, to look out for ourselves if we wanted to go to college. That was on us and uh, made us very independent very early on. That was a rough time for me because of my age during the time. And I had three older brothers. I didn't have a sister I could go to and talk to about it. And um, I had been the apple of my father's eye. So not having him in the house made me, gave me the ability to do things that I would have never dreamed about doing if he had been in the house. Dating early, um, hanging out, partying, because I knew that I didn't have a father to come home and answer to. And then something happened leading into high school. Um, leading into high school, um, though, you know, my, my mother was adopted, and so the woman that had adopted her um, passed away. My mom came back to the States and um, I got to stay with my mom and, and you know got to be and I was excited my mother's husband gets stationed in California and I was asked do I want to come live with her so of course I haven't lived with her for years I had this you know idealistic view of what living with my mom is going to be like yes I want to go and went from growing up in Rosedale Queens mainly surrounded by black Latinos you know to go to Silver Valley High School, <laughs> um, where you know no longer the person of color is you know the majority, like we're the minority at Silver Valley High School. <laughs> um, so that was a huge you know culture shock. It made me extremely rebellious, and what my father saw fit to do was to put me into an exclusive all girls predominantly white, white Anglo-Saxon, Protestant white school for girls. And if it had not been for the exposure at that school and my father every morning would drive me the 35 to 40 minutes from, he would leave his home, come to my mother's home, pick me up, get on highways and byways 35 to 40 minutes every day to get me to this school. And our conversation to the school was half listening to the news station and him telling me that I came from kings and queens and that I should be able to make it there and that he knew I would be able to make it there. You know, whether we were talking about sports, because I all of a sudden was thrust into a world where I had to pay, play field hockey and lacrosse. <laughs> you know, I'm wearing a uniform, it's all kinds of new good stuff. And every morning on our ride, our journey to school, my father would talk to me about his beliefs in me and what I would be able to do. One, the view that I had of living with my mom was not what I had dreamt up in my head. There were all of these new rules and um, new experiences to deal with at the same time of dealing with, you know, I, my brown skin is no longer the majority in this area. Um, and so it, it was a tough navigation 
um, my high school years, both with my mom and with navigating high school. Now, my father now is 75 years old. Just five years ago, he was like, I have to tell you a secret. I have to tell you something. So I'm assuming, I'm like, what is it, Daddy? I'm assuming he's sick or something going on. He said, no, I'll tell you. I was getting ready to travel to North Carolina to see my mother. He said, I'll tell you when you get back. I said, no, Daddy, what is it? And he said, well, I have another family out here. And I'm like, I was just so quiet. And so he told me about a sister and a brother, and there was another one that he had from another woman. It not only hit my family and my sisters, it also hit the young lady who thought somebody else was her father all her life. So imagine being told that the person who was your father is not your father. To this day, I have a resentment and um, it's just shocking. I welcome her as my sister. I, I love her. She looked just like me. And again, you see the similarities, my brother, he looked just like my other brother. It's just crazy because we're living in the same borough. We could have dated each other. When I came home after graduation, I was in the city of Philadelphia for less than a year. And I think in large part because as I'm driving with my new car, newly minted degree, interning at a job, you know, bank, yeah, I'm doing it all. And I'm living this life and I'm literally having to drive past my brothers on the street. Sometimes I honk the horn, sometimes I'd be like, damn, I hope they don't see me. You could clearly see that my brothers were crackheads. That was devastating for me um, to have to drive past them. But I followed my mother's lead with it because my mother was not an enabler. When my brothers would come past the house, knock on the door, my mother would speak to them out of the top window. She would not come downstairs because it had gotten to a point where she said enough. And one of her favorite sayings is, it ain't no sense in everybody being miserable. And we really lived that. And to this day, my brothers who have been clean for, wow, over 20 years each, and one of my brothers speaks for NA, Narcotics Anonymous now, they credit my mother's tough love, very tough love, and her nickname is Tuffy. So Tuffy was distributing <laughs> tough love all around um, with regard to, you know, their issues at that time. I just finished teaching a class that was meant to prepare uh, high school graduates for their first year of college. And I ended the class with a sort of mini lecture on cultural capital. And I think uh, that's one of the things that concerns me a lot right now is that um, we seem to be having a hard time preparing our young people uh, to enter the mainstream. And I know that there's all this talk about us being in a post-racial society, et cetera, which I think is, is just ridiculous. Uh, and I think I see in some young women a lot more confidence, which is really encouraging, especially this group of young women. You know, they're ready to go to college. They're used to being the top of their class. Uh, but their behavior in class was at times entirely inappropriate. Uh, and when I challenged one student on it, she became so defiant. <laughs> and I think if she had known she was dealing with me, she might not have been.